You're probably wondering why at Christmas time I chose Psalm 91 <laughs> instead of uh, Matthew chapter 1 uh, and chapter 2. Or Luke chapter 2 that deals with the birth of Christ and the shepherd's coming. Well, we need to understand that the birth of Christ took place because of important events that had to take place. He came in order to give his life for you and me. For him to come and not do anything would have been irrelevant. But he came for one purpose. That was to give his life. To ransom you and me. That we might one day have life with him at his second coming. Amen. And those are two important events. The giving of his life for us to ransom us. And his desire to come again that we might be with him in the earth made new. I've often wondered what it was like there uh, to live in the time of Christ. I've often thought I would have loved to have been there uh, and followed him around and listened to all that he had to say. But then I can read God's word and listen to important things that he said. You know, as I think of the time of Christ, the time that uh, he lived in, there, uh, have you ever wondered what it was like to be a leper in the time of Jesus? You know, an outcast of society. You had to cry unclean, unclean wherever you went. And what's interesting is the principles of the management of infectious diseases. They are that set forth in Leviticus chapter 13. They have not been improved upon since they were first given to Moses for their simplicity and their effectiveness. There are a number, there were a number of things that were referred to as leprosy. For instance, psoriasis. They saw as a form of leprosy. Uh, they also saw uh, vitiligo as a form of leprosy. My sister Juanita uh, had that. There, uh, but then there was Hansen's disease. And Hansen's disease is the leprosy that we think of when we think of the leper that came to Jesus. There, there were three types uh, of leprosy. One was fast growing, another was sort of medium growing, and the third was it took a long time for it to show itself. You would be carrying disease, but it didn't show itself from anywhere from two to 20 years. But the leper that came to Jesus, he had Hansen's disease. The Luke says in chapter five, he was full of leprosy. And Helen White, in describing that scene where that leper came to Jesus, she says, in Desire of Ages, he was a loathsome spectacle. The disease had made frightful inroads, and his decaying body was horrible to look upon. No wonder Luke said he was full of leprosy. What would you do if you lived back then and you noticed a white blotch on your arm? You would probably cover it and you would pray like you never prayed before, that it wasn't leprosy. The man that came to Jesus had the fast-growing leprosy. 
And he could see it grow and become larger and larger. And he determined that he was going to see Jesus. He had been a leper for we don't know how many years. But he had heard about a man that could make blind people see. That could make lame people walk again. That could make deaf people hear. And mute people speak. He heard that he could even cast out devils. Maybe, just maybe, he could make a leper whole. And he determined that he was going to see Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you would make me a nail on the wall. And there you would hang a portrait of Jesus in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. May we see him today as we never saw him before. I pray in his name. Amen. John in chapter 1 says, Without him was not anything made that was made. Actually, the word made, it, that word, Greek word can be translated made, but really the best word in translating that is existence. And John is saying, you know, that by him all things were brought into existence that exists. In other words, I can cut down a tree and uh, saw up the wood and make things. My boys and I have done that. But Jesus called things into existence that did not exist. Like the Bible says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And so I think of, you know, the web telescope and the beautiful pictures that we now see of, of the heavens and the galaxies that are out there, 14 million light years away. It's amazing. The last church I had that I retired from, there I had a lady that came to church every Sabbath. And her husband, Peter, he would come once in a while. And then he started coming every Sabbath. And then he said, I'm going to be gone for uh, a few weeks. He said, but when I come back, Pastor, I'll, I'll come back to church again. And uh, so he was gone, and he didn't tell me where he was going, but I found out when he came back. You know, to look at him, you would think that he was just an ordinary person. You wouldn't know what was between these two ears of his. But they were having a problem with the, with the web telescope. And they couldn't figure out how to keep any moisture from farming on it. And so they called up Peter. And Peter went out and he solved the problem for them in two weeks. So we never judge people by what we see. There I had another pastor in the same, uh, elder in the same church. There, uh, in fact, he was my head elder. And uh, to look at Dan, you would think he was just an average individual. But he worked for NASA. NASA had a huge building uh, there in Maryland. In fact, it was maybe about five miles from his house. And every once in a while, he'd take his his uh, bicycle and pedal to work. But when they were going to send a rocket ship into space, they would give him its weight and the amount of thrust that it was going to produce and where they wanted it to go. And he would mathematically work out all the details of what had to be done to get that rocket to go exactly where they wanted it to go. And to look at Dan, you wouldn't even think 
that between those two ears was a tremendous mathematician. You know, as you look at the pictures from the Hubble telescope, there the astronomers tell us that there are over 100 billion trillion galaxies in the universe. And our galaxy is a small one. It has a little over 200 billion stars uh, in it. Some of them are huge. They have over 400 billion stars in it. And you wonder how many suns in this galaxy has planets going around it that are inhabited. There, the book of Job tells us that there was a time when the sons of God had a meeting in heaven with God. And I've often wondered if it was just the leaders from, you know, the planets that were inhabited in our galaxy. Because if it was all the people from all the galaxies throughout the universe, I don't think heaven would be big enough to hold them all. Over a hundred billion trillion galaxies, and many of them with inhabited worlds around them. Some of them having over 400 billion suns whirling around. And who knows how many planets are revolving around them. Do you know that 10 years ago, they have these satellites up there, and these satellites are used in a particular way. Like one will measure the carbon that's on a distant planet. Another one will measure the methane. Or another one will measure the nitrogen that is on that planet. And they focused on one planet. It wasn't a big one, but they focused on it. It was a new one that they had found. They wanted to find out everything about it. And you know what they discovered about that planet? That planet was one solid diamond. Can you imagine that? One solid diamond. We have no idea the beauty that is out there in space. And there was one galaxy with a small world that was in what they call the Goldilocks zone. You remember the story of Goldilocks? Father Bear's porridge was too hot. Mama Bear's porridge was too cold. But Baby Bear's porridge was just right. And there was one galaxy that had a world in it that was in the Goldilocks zone. It wasn't too far from the sun, and it wasn't too close to the sun. It was just right. And we are told that one of those inhabitants of that little world that was in the Goldilocks zone, for whatever reason, decided to listen and believe a talking serpent than to listen and talking to God. We're told in the Tsar of Ages 834, before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. We usually don't picture God, you know, shaking hands with someone. Then we're going to find out that he actually encircles his arms around someone. And this uh, pledge that Jesus and the Father made together was fulfilled when on the cross he said, it's finished. That he had fulfilled the pledge that he had made before he called this world into existence, before he formed Adam and Eve with his own hands. Unlike the leper who came to Jesus and fell at his feet and said, Lord, 
If thou wilt, you can make me clean. If you want to, you can make me whole. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. But the inhabitants of this world, they covered themselves with fig leaves and they hid from the only one who could make them whole, who could restore them to at one man with God. Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, immediately a change passed over the leper. His flesh became healthy, the nerves sensitive, the muscles firm, the rough scaly skin peculiar to leprosy disappeared, and a soft glow like that upon the skin of a healthy child took place. Ellen White said he was a horrible sight. Leprosy had made terrible inroads. He had probably by this time lost his ears. Part of his nose was gone. Ulcers on his face were dripping with plasma. But when Jesus touched him, when he said, I will, be thou clean, he restored. He had his nose back, his ears back. His skin was like that, she says, of a healthy child. You see, God never stops halfway, does he? And he doesn't want to stop halfway with you. He wants you to surrender all to him so that he can make you all that he wants you to be that he has a right to expect you to be. When Jesus ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives, those who had been raised to life at his resurrection, and those that were raised to life at his resurrection were people who had been martyred for him. They also rose with Jesus and taken to heaven with him. You read about it in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. And as they in Christ entered those gates into heaven, and as he came before his father, Ellen White says in the Tsar of Hages 834, he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. You see, that's why we celebrate the birth of Christ, because Jesus wants us to be with him. And parents, you need, before you open, the kids open their gifts tomorrow morning, you need to sit down and explain to them why Jesus came. He came to live just like them, but to live a sin-free life. He came just like them because he was going to give his life for them on Calvary. But three days later, he was going to be risen from his grave. And now he looks with anticipation to come back again so that you kids can be with him forever. Amen. That's what needs to take place tomorrow morning before the gifts are opened. But the world has forgotten about that, and unfortunately, many Adventists have forgot about that. And when Christmas Day comes, all they can think about is the presents under the tree. And they forget that the baby that was born in Bethlehem came for a purpose. It was to give his life a ransom for every one of you sitting here in this church today. And it was his purpose to so change you 
that when he comes again, he can take you with him back to heaven. And after a thousand years, to bring you back to this earth with the new Jerusalem. And unfortunately, there will be billions raised to life who chose to live their life as they chose and not the way God chooses. And they will be destroyed in the fires of hell. And God, then God will create the world all over again. Can you imagine what it would be like to live a million years? No, you celebrate your millionth birthday. What will that be like? And you know that you have forever to continue living. I mean, time is irrelevant because you are going to live for eternity. And you will be able to visit every planet that God has created that's inhabited. You know, you stop and think eternity. A hundred billion trillion galaxies with billions of suns and billions of worlds going around them. You know, I don't think in eternity you have had time to visit them all. I mean, it's amazing. But Ellen White continues after she <laughs> makes that statement. I will that those that you have given me be with me where I am. She says, the voice of God is heard, proclaiming that justice is satisfied, Satan is vanquished, Christ's struggling, toiling ones on earth are accepted in the beloved. But I like what she writes next. One little sentence. She says, the Father's arms encircle the Son, and the word is given that all the angels of God worship him. The Father's arms encircle his Son. We don't picture God, you know, that being sitting on a throne, surrounded by glory. We don't picture him shaking hands. We don't picture him wrapping his arms around people. But the Bible says he rejoices over us with singing. Can you imagine what it will be like to hear him sing one day to us? Amazing. Tomorrow is the greatest day, really, of the year. It's the one day that people remember the birth of a little child in Bethlehem. That little village back then is still there today, only it's a huge city today, much bigger. There tomorrow you will be giving gifts to those that you love. It is supposed to remind us of the gift of God's Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Savior of the world, our Redeemer. But the world, even the majority of God's people, when they wake up tomorrow, have their mind only on one thing, and that's the gifts under the tree. The joy of watching their kids open them. And they forget that it wasn't just to change us, to say, you know, it wasn't just to save us that Jesus came. It was to change us. He can't save us without changing us. We can never go to heaven with the characters that we have. He wants to take away our evil temper. He wants to take away our impatient spirit. He wants to change every facet of our lives because he wants us to be just like him in character. And he has the power to change you if you will let him. 
We need to plead with God to write his law in our hearts and our minds. And he will do both. You read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 16, chapter 10 of Hebrews. And God says, I want to write my law on your hearts and your minds. And you read in Philippians 2.13, he wants to work within us both to will and to do his good pleasure. In the book Desire of Ages, Ellen White makes this statement. By what means did he, meaning Jesus, by what means did he overcome in the conflict with Satan? And then she gives a secret in five words. She says, by the word of God. Only by the word could he resist temptation. Now you know why it's so important that we study God's word. If it was the only way Christ could over temptation, then it's the only way that we can overcome temptation. David said in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. I remember when I was pastoring in the little church uh, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and uh, I went and visited this little Armenian lady. She must have been almost 90. And she was thrilled to have the pastor come uh, and visit her. And she had in her hand this little tablet. It was about three inches wide and maybe four or five inches long. And you would flip the pages over like this. And uh, she showed me her tablet. And uh, I flipped through the pages and... On every page, there was a verse written. And then she showed me a box there that was next to the chair that she was in. And it was full of these tablets. And she told me, she says, Pastor, she said, every day I wrote a verse from Scripture. And I finally went through the whole Bible. And the scripture that I wrote down, I memorized it for that day. She had memorized the Bible from beginning to end. We need to spend time memorizing God's word to take it with us. Every promise in God's word is ours to claim. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you and me are to live. The Tsar of Ages says, when assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self, but to the power of the word. All its strength is ours. David wrote in Psalm 17, by the word of thy lips, I have kept from the paths of evil. He says, it's by your word that I have been able to walk with you. Not only do we need the word of God, but we need a fresh indwelling of the Holy Spirit every day. Before I roll out of bed every morning, I always pray and ask God to anoint me and my wife with the Holy Spirit for that day. And I ask him to write his law in our hearts and minds for that day. I ask him to enthrone Jesus in our lives for that day. And I ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keeps the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. Are you letting God build your house so that when Jesus comes again, you can go home with him. 
You know, God's word says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. The Lord will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. Every morning when I have my private devotions, there uh, I take, I go out there in the garage and I take one of the folding chairs and Mary Ann's little dog, Nikki, she's right behind me. In fact, she gets to the folding chairs before I do. There and she's prancing around, I take the chair and I made a little uh, wooden uh, platform for her, put a rug on top of it. And I go out and I unfold the chair and there I put the, the uh, board on my lap and she jumps up on it. Then she looks all over the place and then she lays down on the board and uh, she's satisfied. And while she's there, I lift up my voice and I have my worship with God. And I do three things. I quote Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, I will not lack for anything. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. In other words, he will provide all of our needs. And we can be safe in his arms. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Did you notice that? It's for his name's sake. He leads you in the paths of righteousness so you, that you can rightly represent him before those whom you come in contact with every day especially with your family, your wife, your children, your husband. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you notice how many promises are in that psalm? That psalm is full of promises. And then I like to quote The Desire of Ages, page 324. And you've heard me quote some of the passages from it before. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. And a change is wrought. The man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural energy into God's people. She says, in that passage, that if we surrender ourselves to Jesus, that we become a fortress in which only his word is heard. And she says that the soul that is surrendered to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world. And he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept by the heavenly agencies, is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. And you read the rest of that page, and the, the promises that are there for you. But this first one, amazing. You surrender your soul to Christ, and a new power will take possession of your life. and will make you what God wants you to be. And then I quote Psalm 91. Did you notice all the, the promises that are in Psalm 91? 
That psalm you need to memorize because it will be your strength in the coming days ahead when the world turns against God's people. At the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ellen White gives a commentary on that statement. She says, happy are those who recognize their spiritual poverty and feel their need of redemption. Have you humbled yourself before God to where you see your need, your spiritual poverty and your need? You know, we really don't see ourselves as we really are as God sees us. We tend to think we're okay. But we're not okay today to be ready for heaven. We need a lot of changes. And you know, there's a problem for Seventh-day Adventists. And the problem that was mentioned in the Sabbath school this morning, you know, every one of you here, you know what Adventists believe. You know the 27 fundamental beliefs. But can you sit down and study with someone and show them why you believe the way you do with the Bible in your hands? Do you know those verses that, you know, have you memorized them so that you can share them with people? Because one day you're going to have to. And as I mentioned in Sabbath school this morning, the, the young fellow that was in college with me back in 61, who became a teacher in the seminary and a teacher at Loma Linda in the school of religion there. And how he now says that, you know, things have changed. And what Ellen White wrote about the papacy isn't going to happen the way she said it in great controversy because times have changed. He is one smart individual. And I'll tell you right now, if you don't know your Bible, if he is there in court with you, he will take and make you look so foolish you wish you had never been brought there. We need to know God's Word. And the only way you can know it is by studying it. Ellen White makes a statement in Desire and the Great Controversy in that chapter, The Scriptures a Safeguard. And she says, only those who have made it a habit to study God's Word every day will be able to go through the last great time of trouble. We need to be students of God's Word. We need to fully understand, especially, you know, those five pillars of the Advent faith. You think back of 1844, and the first one was the Sabbath, Frederick Wheeler. And of course, with the Sabbath, it's right in the heart of God's law. The second one was the sanctuary doctrine. And the third one, you know, after the sanctuary doctrine it was uh, understood, there God gave the spirit of prophecy in December. And then the state of the dead was understood, and the second coming of Christ was understood. The five great pillars of Adventism. It's one thing to acknowledge them, but it's another thing to prove them to someone from Scripture. And that's what Christmas is all about. While Calvary is extremely important, he came not only as the Lamb, but to be our deliverer from sin. The Lamb had to be slain. And the blood of the Lamb had to be applied. And that's what Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary today. Applying his blood in your behalf and mine. You know, are you ready 
for that time? Is your family ready for Jesus to come? I want to close with a statement from Ellen White that not very many people have ever heard. There, uh, Elder Robinson and another individual was standing with Ellen White on the train depot. And as they were standing there, she turned to them and she said, a terrible storm of persecution was coming like a wooden storm that blew down every standing object. There was not a Seventh-day Adventist to be seen. They, like the disciples, forsook Christ and fled. All who had sought positions were never seen again. After the storm, there was a calm. Then the Adventists arose like a great flock of sheep, but there were no shepherds. They all waited earnestly, praying for help and wisdom. And the Lord answered by helping them to choose leaders from among themselves who had never sought positions before. They prayed earnestly for the Holy Spirit which was poured out upon them, making them fully ready for service. They went forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army of banners to give the message to the world. And then Robinson says, I was so astonished. And I asked if it applied to Loma Linda as we were looking in that direction. Sister White replied to my question by stating, that it applied to the entire denominational world. I was so stunned, I asked no more questions. Let us each determine, by God's grace, to be in that great flock of sheep that she saw arise. You know, when Jesus came to this world, and I want to read this statement from Ellen White. She says, remember that Christ risked all, tempted like as we are. He staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. Notice, she says, he staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. To the honor and glory of God, his beloved son, the surety, the substitute, was delivered up and descended into the prison house of the grave. The new tomb enclosed him in its rocky chambers. If one single sin had tainted his character, the stone would never have been rolled away from the door of his rocky chambers, and the world with its burden of guilt would have perished. Jesus would have never come forth from the grave, and you and I would never have a chance for eternal life. Let's each of us determine that we're going to look past the birth of Christ and we're going to see Calvary in a new light and the second coming of Christ. That's what he is waiting and longing for, his second coming, because he wants to take you home with him. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's loving Jesus enough to trust him and trusting him enough to be obedient to him and learning of him and going home with him when he comes. Before we sing the song, come on up here. Come, come. There was a man in Ireland, his name was Joseph Scriven. 
And he was riding on his horse to meet his beloved. He had known her since they were little children. And the next day, they were to be married. And so they were meeting in a favorite place of theirs to talk about their future, what it would be like. And uh, as his bride-to-be, Eliza, was riding her horse across the little stream to their favorite spot on the other side, the horse got startled and reared up, and she fell off. And her head hit a rock. Joseph came by about two minutes later. He saw the horse standing there in the stream. He saw his beloved laying in the water, and he rushed over. But he could not bring her back to life. She had drowned in the stream. Every place that he went in that little town that they lived in, he saw her. And so he bought a ticket and he sailed to Canada. And there he helped people, elderly people. You see, when she died, his whole life was wrapped up in her and his Savior. And when she died, he said in his heart, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In Canada, he finally met an individual. They became good friends. And his friend, after he saw the type of character that Joseph had, introduced him to his sister. And after a while, Joseph fell in love with her because he saw in her a person that loved Jesus. And so he asked her to marry him. And she said yes, and they set their wedding date. But two weeks before the wedding date, she got pneumonia and was sick. And he cared for her, every need that she needed. He was there at the family house, taking care of her every need. But she died a few days before they were to be married. After that incident, he got a letter saying that his mother was sick. So he wrote a letter to his mother, and with it, he put a poem that he had written. A few years later, he became sick, and he was laying in bed that he didn't know that he would never arise from it. But a friend came, his friend, and sat down in a chair beside his bed, talking with him. And he saw on the little table that Joseph had by the bed these pages that were written on. And he asked Joseph if he could look at it, and Joseph said yes. And as he read it, he found the poem that he had sent to his mother beautiful poem. And when Joseph died, he had it published. And it became a favorite poem of the people. And then an individual who was a musician put the poem of Joseph Scriven to word, to music. And that's what we're going to sing in closing. Because the words but that song needs to be in our heart. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. <laughs>